What's going on YouTube, it's Tej back again with another video and today I'm coming at you with my top 32 best value selections, basically one pick for all 32 NFL teams. What pick from each team do I think had the best value? Now, let me hear your thoughts down below in the comment section. Throughout this video, I want to hear who you think maybe the Dolphins best value pick, who the Cardinals best value pick was, the Steelers. I want to hear all your thoughts down below in the comment section. And of course, I want to hear who you think the best value selection was for your favorite squad. Also, be sure to tell me who your favorite team is down below in the comment section, just so we know there's no confusion. But excited to bring this video to you. And then later on this week, we're going to do in my favorite fit uh, for one selection for all 32 teams. What pick basically uh, represents the best fit for their offense or defense. So try to bring that video your way. Hopefully you guys enjoy. Hit that like button if you do. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. And of course, again, leave your comments down below. But let's go ahead and start with the AFC East of Sirens Torrance. I mean, they got him in the second round when I wouldn't have been mad if they took him at 27, right? Had they not traded up to get Dalton Kincaid, I wonder if O'Torrance was on their board uh, or Sirens Torrance, excuse me, was on their board uh, to be the pick of 27. And instead they get him at 59. I mean, Plug and play starter uh, to me, uh, right there at right guard over Ryan Bates. Doesn't have the most gaudy movement skills, but I think he, I think he's fine. I think he'll, he'll be just fine. And you know, if anything, he'll be better on the move than Roger Saffold was last last year at left guard. So uh, if they're willing to take a shot on Saffold, I think they're willing to let Torrance, you know, kind of earn that starting spot right away. And you know, we'll see. I mean, maybe this signals a pivot uh, a little bit in the offensive uh, focus for the Bills, it's getting a little bit more run game oriented there. And I think Torrance would help them out if they do move in that direction. Uh, then we get the Dolphins, Cam Smith, who easily to me could have been a late first rounder, early early second rounder. He falls all the way to 51 and they add even more ball skills to a Vic Fangio defense that already features Jalen Ramsey and Xavier Howard. Oh my God. I mean, and Javon Holland. I mean, this team, I'd be kind of shocked if they don't lead the league in picks. I mean, we'll see. The interceptions are a very varied stat, uh, lack of poor phrasing there, but, um, nevertheless, uh, with the amount of ball players and ball skills that they have, in that secondary, I'd be shocked if they don't lead uh, the league in interceptions. And Cam Smith at 51, I think they got a good uh, fit for that defense, but also some really, really good value for potential first rounder. Uh, and then we get to the Patriots, Christian Gonzalez. I mean, to me, there is just no reason he made it to 17. And then the fact that New England traded back, got an extra fourth round pick, and still got a guy who has all the tools for Bill Belichick to develop and already has good tape under his belt. Like, I I, I think he's already a pretty solid player, and it had, comes with a relatively high floor given his arm length, his size, the athleticism. I think all that's there to make him a solid player at the worst. But then you put him in a Bill Belichick defense and it's like, all right, well, let's see what Christian Gonzalez can develop into. And maybe he could be the next shutdown corner and they get him at 17 behind Emmanuel Forbes. I mean, yeah, that's going to be one that we'll have to revisit in a couple of years time to see who ultimately got it right, Washington or New England. Uh, and then for the Jets, Joe Titman, this was a pretty easy one for me. Uh, a guy who we heard rumblings could go late one. And then, you know, there's a handful of teams to start out the second round that to me were like, hey, if they draft a center here, I'm not surprised. Uh, but ultimately the Jets get him middle of second, future starter and replacement for Connor McGovern. So uh, also a great scheme fit. So I thought that was really solid value. Um, honorable mention to Izzy Abanacanda, which, you know, to me, he was kind of a fourth round running back, but uh, really interesting scheme fit. And uh, with that type of explosiveness, I'm a little surprised he made it as far as he did. But that takes us then to the AFC South. Um, Texans Tank Dell, uh, to me, should have been a second rounder. We had a lot of these wide receivers fall further than I think they should. Hyatt, Tillman, Tank Dell, another name. Uh, Downs, just throw one more out there who we'll talk about uh, in that Best 32 Fits video. But... I mean, I think Tank Dell could be Brandon Cooks in this offense. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying he's going to be as good as Brandon Cooks, who has been a perennial pro bowler and has put up 1,000-yard <laughs> seasons with pretty bad quarterback play in, in multiple years and multiple stops in his career, which is super impressive. Uh, but I think Tank Dell can do a lot of that same stuff, uh, not only just utilizing his speed, pushing the ball down the field, but was a volume receiver at Houston. I think he can do some of the same stuff. And he's such a good route runner that, yeah, he's small and he's 165 pounds. So he's not bodying dudes over the middle. But if he's open, I mean, then what's the problem? Uh, and also can be used underneath, yak, uh, gadget type of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think it easily, again, fill that Brandon Cooks role. And then get him in the third round. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and then Darius Rush, you know, I kind of talked about this in my, you know, top 20 steals. So there's going to be some overlap with some of these names, including three of the guys on this screen. So I'll be brief here. And then if you missed that video, definitely go back and check it out. It came out yesterday. But Rush, I mean, they drafted a guy who has mid 4-3 speed, awesome arm length, great play under his belt, and was great at the senior bowl, and he fell the fifth round. I, I, I'm a little puzzled as to why that was, but I think the Colts, depending on what happens with Kenny Moore and Isaiah Rogers, 
they could have just drafted a potential future starter. And, and I almost put Jalen Jones in here because I'm like, dude, Jalen Jones, if he goes to a cover three heavy defense, he's going to thrive. So I was thinking San Francisco and I was thinking Indianapolis and they get him in the seventh round. So Rush slash Jalen Jones, really, really great values here. Jones gets the honorable mention just because I think Rush is a slightly better player. But I think either one of those guys could develop into a future starter for Indy. And then the Jags, Antonio Johnson, to me, they drafted a guy who could become better than Rayshon Jenkins and currently is probably better than Trey Herndon in the nickel. Uh, so he kind of, you know, fills two shoes at once. Uh, and they get him in the fifth round. I mean, this is this is my number two safety. Uh, and I mean, this is a bad safety class for sure. But, you know, still, Brian Branch to me was a top 10 player in this class. And then I thought Antonio Johnson, once you get into the mid 30s, it's like, okay, maybe we can see his name come off the board here. Uh, but ultimately, he falls all the way to the fifth round. Uh, and I think the Jags, again, drafted a starter here. Uh, either the nickel or strong safety or a little bit of both, uh, which is super exciting. And again, the, the value there is insane. Honorable mention to Parker Washington, who's a guy I thought, you know, I, I thought really highly of. But I do worry about where he fits into the mix in that wide receiver room in Jacksonville. Let me get to the Colts. Will Levis. I mean... You get QB4 at pick 33. Yeah, he was my QB2, but QB4 off the board, that is. Um, and, and yeah, after you watch two of your division rivals draft a quarterback, and you know, obviously you just lost to Jacksonville uh, in week 18, or not just lost, but you know, the most recent game Tennessee played was losing week 18 to give the Jags a division. Right now, they are looking outside versus all those other teams who are playing on the inside with their future franchise quarterback. So they had to make something happen there. They did not have to give up a whole lot moving from 41 up to 33. And they get a guy who, to me, was war worthy of being a top 10 pick. And who knows, like if the quarterback order plays out a little differently, we might've gotten the four quarterbacks in the top 10 that I thought we were gonna get. Like if Levis is the pick at four for Indy, Anthony Richardson's not staying on the board for long. So, um, you know, very, very well could have broken out in a different way, but instead Tennessee stays patient, wait till day two, move up, barely give up any capital and get a future franchise quarterback option. I mean, the process there is just fantastic. All right, next division, let's talk about the AFC West. Drew Sanders is just a perfect Vance Joseph type of linebacker. I'd have been happy if Sanders went to any of the Belichick disciples, uh, Wink Martindale in New York, and then Vance Joseph, kind of the same thing. These guys who like to blitz their inside linebackers. Pittsburgh's another team to kind of call out there. Um, and then the Broncos get him in the third round? I think this guy could easily be a plug-and-play starter. And it's nothing against Josie Jewell or Alex Singleton. I just think Sanders has a different skill set than those guys. You know, Jewell is a really good coverage player with good athleticism. Alex Singleton can do a little bit of everything. And of those three, probably the best run defender. Sanders right now is raw in coverage and run defense, but he is a really good blitzing linebacker and played some straight up edge uh, at Alabama before transferring to Arkansas. But, you know, with the Razorbacks, the athleticism showed. So that was also what made it a little weird that he fell the way to the third round. At the time of the start of the NFL draft, he was the odds on betting favorite to be the first linebacker off the board. I stayed, you know, uh, stayed with my claim that it was going to be Jack Campbell and that it was. But nevertheless, it wouldn't have surprised me if Sanders was because five-star recruit, hella athleticism, great blitzer, pass rush upside, like all those things kind of checked out. So uh, I'd be interested to see if the Broncos keep him at inside linebacker. I hope they do. And hopefully they keep Baron Browning at edge and then they use Sanders as a blitzer from the inside because I, I think that's the best way to handle those two guys. Uh, and then the Chiefs, Felix and Yudike Ozama, this was a tough team for me. To, and there were a couple teams where the value part of this was like, I, I, is this their best value pick? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, I'm kind of giving the Chiefs the benefit of the doubt because, you know, Wanya Morris I wasn't in love with, but there's definitely some upside to mine there. Rasheed Rice over Cedric Tillman, Jalen Hyatt, Josh Down, like a lot of guys. I was like, mm, I don't know about that. Uh, but Felix and Yudike Ozama can at least say, at 31, I can, I can support that. Uh, and he's an edge rusher they don't really have. That super bendy, you know, flexible, lean type of edge, you know, because uh, they have um, Charles Amenehu. They got George Karloftis, who are much more beefy, power-based guys. And Amenehu is pretty good against the run. And Judike Ozama is a different type of edge. So I think they got him in a good spot. And they, you know, kind of balanced out that um, that edge group uh, pretty well. But again, Kansas City was kind of a tough team for me to say, yeah, that was a great value pick. And who was Andrew Judike Ozama just might end up being the guy that's like, mm, that was the best of those picks, but still not necessarily insane value. Oh, the Chargers, Diane Henley. So kind of repeating myself from yesterday, um, just to get him in the third round. I, I, know, I know it wasn't a great linebacker class, but uh, in an NFL that's moving more and more into a pass heavy direction, the guy who is 24 years old, ton of college experience, feels like a guy who could be a plug and play impact player in pass coverage. It's a little surprised that he fell to the middle of the third round. Um, and then for the Chargers, it's a fantastic scheme fit. So I love it from that perspective. And again, you know, 
I, I know he's a little older, but I thought a team, especially late first, you know, contenders in the second, we're going to be like, that's a guy who can help us right now. Um, especially with his coverage ability and feeling like that's going to translate right away. Uh, so I was surprised that he fell this far. And I think the Chargers, you know, stayed patient and they got a really good starting option uh, and inside linebacker because of it. And then the Raiders, Christopher Smith, you know, Smith, Smith is a tough one because I look at the tape and I'm like, this guy should be, you know, potentially safety three or four for me, you know, uh, but then you look at the athletic testing, it's like, this guy shouldn't get drafted. Now, that's hyperbolic, but I mean, those numbers were really, really rough. The 40, the three cone, the brudge. It's like, dude, what? How can you be this bad of an athlete and go to Georgia? So I, I don't know. I don't know what side of my feelings about Chris Smith I should lean into. The bad athletic testing or the great tape that I see where it feels like he moves faster than that. Um, so I don't know. This is a little bit of a TBD, but for the Raiders to take a shot on him in day three, I think that's an awesome spot to nab him up. And if he does work out, you have your over-the-top free safety. Trevon Merrick moves close to the box, playing strong safety, a little bit of nickel corner. I am here for it. Um, and I think it just kind of rounds out that safety room. But that is obviously leaning into an asterisk and saying, Chris Smith is going to be a hit. No guarantee that he does. But nonetheless, day three, it's totally worth finding out if the player exceeds the athletic testing numbers that he posted. All right, on to the AFC North. Uh, Andrew Voorhees, I talked about this yesterday. I mean, the Ravens drafted a perfect scheme fit and a future starter in the seventh round. Uh, what are we doing here? If you told every team that they could draft the future starter in just literally as short of a time period as one year at the worst, seventh round would be a whole lot more entertaining and there'd be a lot more ratings, right? Like there'd be a lot more people watching the seventh round. Uh, so that's, you know, I know the ACL injury, it was pretty late in the process, but... We're not drafting rookies just for one year, right? You know, like, I don't know. I think that's a little bit of a flaw in the process and how you evaluate these these prospects. To me, this is your future plug-and-play guy at left guard. You let Kevin Zeitler walk after this upcoming season, and then Ben Cleveland's your right guard of the future. If Ben Cleveland even, you know, like, who knows? Maybe he's really bad this year. They re-sign Zeitler, and he's just replaces Cleveland. There's a lot of different ways this ball could bounce, but in a lot of the different ways that this could play out, I see Andrew Voorhees as their starting left guard. So uh, the fact they got him in the seventh round is just absolute absolute value. I mean, it's the definition of value. Uh, the Bengals, DJ Turner. I almost went Jordan Bell. You know, again, you know, Chris Smith is a guy I really like. He's been around the channel long enough. You know, I said Chris Smith could have been safety three or four. Realistically, those guys probably were Jamie Robinson and Jordan Battle because I have loved those guys throughout this entire process. But just like Chris Smith, really bad athletic numbers. So decided to, you know, pass on Battle, who I do think could be a great Von Bell replacement. But instead, DJ Turner, this guy who runs you know, 6283 cone, 42640, and has great tape at Michigan, played in both man and a variety of zones. To me, all that sounds like a guy who should go top 45, top 50. And then I'm getting him 60. So it's not, you know, an insane amount of distance between those two, but a perfect scheme fit for Cincinnati. And again, with those athletic testing numbers, I am surprised that he fell as far as he did because, you know, like athleticism wins in the NFL. Uh, and, you know, and we just, you know, a couple of years ago, we saw Henry Rugg, fastest wide receiver, be the first wide receiver off the board. Obviously, that didn't work out for other reasons, but speed kills. Speed is things that teams covet. Uh, and I just thought because of that, DJ Turner would go a lot higher than where he did to Cincinnati. Uh, Browns, uh, Luke Whippler. This is an easy one. I mean, they drafted their future starting center in the sixth round. So it's a lot of the same things I said about the Ravens. And you, you want to hear more thoughts on this, definitely go back, check out yesterday's video. Luke Whippler uh, is your Ethan Postich uh, replacement there in a year's time. And uh, perfect scheme fit, stays in state. I mean, this one works for a lot of different levels. The Steelers, I'll go Corey Trice. Thought about Keanu Benton. Darnell Washington's kind of hard for me to pass on here, but I'll go Corey Trice just because six foot three, over 200 pounds, awesome athletic numbers, both with the three cone, the 40, the bra, you know, the vertical. He checks a lot of boxes. He's just been battling injuries, right? Um, you know, had to play with a knee brace on because of a you know prior knee injury, and then he ends up, you know, uh, pulling his groin, plays through it, but not playing at 100%. This is an opportunity for the Steelers to take this guy in the seventh round who has all the tools and traits and honestly, pre-injury, has a lot of good tape to look at too and just let him sit for a year, get up to 100%. And then maybe by year two, he's someone that they're playing on the outside. So I, I love the approach here, draft and stash. And I kind of like Voorhees, man. I wouldn't be surprised if Trice, I feel more confident about Voorhees becoming a future starter, but I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if Trice is a, a future outside corner for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And again, they got him in the seventh round. That's insane. And just based off of, you know, 4'4 four, four speed and 6'3, 200 plus pounds, I'm surprised a corner with those types of traits fell as far as Trice did. All right, now we're on to the NFC. 
Cowboys were another tough team where it's like, I don't, you know, Mozzie Smith, not a whole lot of first rounders here for a reason because, you know, the value typically kind of lines up with those guys. And Mozzie, for me, yeah, we'll talk about him in the fits video. Like him more as a fit versus a value. Um, and then Shoemaker I wasn't in love with. I liked Marvin Overshone, but 90 felt about right. So then I, I'm just looking at, you know, Deuce Vaughn. And I'm like, you know what? This whole draft cycle, I've been talking about these teams. Oh, if you draft Zach Charbonnet, he can be your thunder. And you, know, you already got this person to be your lightning. Or the other way around. You're going to draft Devon A. Chain to be your lightning because you already got thunder. Honestly, now I look at the Cowboys backfield and I'm like, well, one, it's, let's just start. I mean, the obvious here. His dad, you know, coached for the Cowboys. That's a great story and makes for a, you know, fun fit, whatever. But now I'm looking at the Cowboys and I'm like, man, you know what? That backfield is what all backfield should look like. I don't care that you don't have a bruiser. Whatever. You have two guys who are awesome in the pass game. You were adding weapons to that passing attack. And that's what's ultimately going to win out. And Deuce Vaughn's receiving ability to fall the seventh round. Like I, I just, I don't know if you can convince me there's 212 or whatever football players better than Deuce Vaughn this year. Yes, he's small. He's five foot five. I understand. But there are not 212 football players better than Deuce Vaughn in this year's class. Um, and now it's him plus Pollard. That amount of receiving ability in the backfield is really, really enticing. So uh, Vaughn obviously has reasons why he fell, but to the seventh, I don't think he should have fallen that far. Uh, Giants, Jalen Hyatt, easy one. We talked about it yesterday. I, I didn't love him when we were talking about him as a first rounder. Was fine with the idea of him being a second rounder. Third round, I'm absolutely here to see what this develops into. At the worst, you're drafting a guy who's going to force the issue over the top, make defenses respect that uh, burning speed, and then it's going to open up the middle of the field because of it. You know, they're, they're, that's at least going to open up some more room for Darren Waller, Isaiah Hodgins, and company. Uh, Saquon Barkley, the receiver, even. But who knows? Maybe maybe Jalen Hyde does take that next step forward and grow that much more as as a receiving weapon, right? Um, and 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 maybe he does add to his route tree and, and adds a little bit of mass and can start working the middle of the field and becomes that much harder to bring down in yak situation. Like who knows from here? And that's where it's like for a third rounder, I'm absolutely wor- it's absolutely worth finding out. First rounder, you're banking a lot on it. Third rounder, it's a shot in the dark, and let's see. And we know at worst he's going to be fast and and you know be that over the top weapon. That unfortunately right now we don't have any wide receivers that have truly played like that. All right, then the Eagles, Moro Jomo. The fact that he went to the seventh round is just an absolute travesty to me. To me, he was a top 100 player in this class. Um, great against the run. I think really solid in pass production. I see moves that are going to translate to the next level. 6'3", 292, solid athleticism. Like I, I just don't know what I'm missing here on Ojomo that. Other people are so low on. Um, but nevertheless, you know, obviously he's going to have a hard time, you know, working himself to the top of that rotation in Philadelphia. But I do think he's going to be a part of that rotation. And, you know, he can be someone who plays four to 500 really productive snaps in the seventh round. I'll take that any day. Uh, Braden Daniels here. And let me just adjust my screen just a little bit to get uh, his full name back into picture. But Braden Daniels, you know, Washington's another one of those draft classes where it's like, I don't really love anything they did, you know. So, you know, San Francisco's the last one. San Francisco and Washington were by far my lowest grades that I gave out in my entire draft grades video. Definitely go back, check it out if you missed it. But um, Daniels, you convinced me, could be a starting left guard of the future. You know, pretty good tape at Utah, good on the move. Uh, it can move people, you know, and sell, like it has good strength in his profile. It's not like he's one or the other, good on the move or strong. He has a little bit of a blend of both. Um, and yeah, I just think he could be an upgrade over Andrew Norwell, uh, or at least that level of play, but much cheaper and much younger, uh, and and more athletic to this point. Where, you know, given where Andrew Norwell is in his career, uh, so don't hate that. But again, that one, Washington's a tough team because I, I don't really love a lot of what they did in the draft. All right, NFC South time. Uh, Clark Phillips, him falling in the fourth round. You know, I saw him a slot only, but he was still a top thirteen corner. I think he was number thirteen in my cornerback rankings, if my memory serves. Um, and I thought even as a nickel, like this guy could be. An, awesome nickel. Uh, I think he plays faster than a lot of his athletic numbers showed. And I think the Falcons, now they have a really interesting situation to play out. Like Richie Grant, I think could be that nickel strong safety hybrid on rundowns. Cause I think he's really good playing in the box and is a good tackler. And then maybe once you get your third and longs, your passing situations, your fourth quarter, things like that. We see Clark Phillips rotate in to play the nickel in those passing situations where obviously he'll be a better fit there than Richie Grant. But uh, never bad to have options. And I think Clark Phillips, at least as like the passing downs nickel, is going to provide a lot of value. And to get him in day three, that's that's awesome. Panthers, I almost win Jamie Robinson, but decided not to. And we'll talk about Robinson uh, in a video later this week. But I went with Chandler Savala because he's just he was a great pass protector at NC State, a massive mover of people. 320 pounds, running a 40, just over five seconds. Like he checked so many boxes and he felt like his name got hot, maybe a little late, but still at the right time-ish to where he would go higher than fourth round. To me, I was like, yeah, he's going to go late second, early third. But he ends up falling to the fourth round. And 
now the Panthers have options. Like he could be Brady Christensen's replacement. Uh, maybe Austin Corbett post his you know contract expiring. Zavala moves over to right guard and replaces him. Or it's Christensen moving over and Zavala plugs in at left guard. I kind of want to see Zavala play at left guard just so he's right next to a Kamaquano, those two NC State uh, left side of the offensive lineman. That'd be really fun to see them uh, united once again. But this just gives them more options. And I-, I think at worst, it's your Christensen upgrade while also maybe being your potential fill-in option for Austin Corbett post the expiration of his contract. So you're just drafting a future start in the fourth round. What's wrong with that? Uh, St. A.T. Perry. You know, I could have gone with a few different names here, but Perry interests me because he runs a mean slant route, you know, almost six foot four and runs four, four, seven. So height, speed, weight, it's all there to feel like this guy should have gone earlier than where he did on, you know, late day three. But also, you know, Michael Thomas is on a one-year restructured contract. No guarantee he's in New Orleans beyond that point. And I could see A.T. Perry becoming the other outside wide receiver and not only doing the slant stuff that, you know, Michael Thomas is, you know, doing and not trying to throw strays in his direction, but he is slant boy. And, you know, I think A.T. Perry could be that guy uh, post Michael Thomas, but also one more guy. Again, 4.47 speed at his height is really, really impressive. You already got Chris Olave to force defenses to respect the deep ball. And Derek Carr's got a good enough arm. And you throw A.T. Perry in the mix, now you got two guys that defense had to respect over the top. And, you know, playing and play out, you don't know which one of them is going to try to test you over the top. So I, I could see A.T. Perry becoming a really solid starter for, you know, a late day three guy. And it's like, wow, why did this guy fall so far when he became a starter and he had that size, had that speed? Like, uh, what did we miss? And ultimately the Saints benefit because of it. And then the Bucks, I'll go Jose Ramirez, really productive edge rusher at Eastern Michigan. Um, not necessarily the most gaudy, you know, height, weight, six foot two, 245, but not bad either. And I could just see him. I don't know if he'll be like, you know, every down starter. But I could see him kind of being like a James Houston type. Uh, you know, Houston had a freak end of last season, no doubt. But I'm not saying Jose Ramirez is going to do that. But he easily could be this guy. It's like, man, you know, they got him in the sixth round. But this guy has been playing some really meaningful football for us. And let's say the Bucks in two years' time are back in playoff contention. He could easily be one of those guys that's like an unsung hero to a playoff team because he plays 450 to 500 snaps a year. And it's just an awesome pass rusher. And once you get into passing situations, you know Jose Ramirez is coming to the field and you know he's going to be a problem to deal with. Like I could totally see him developing into that type of guy. So again, not an every down dude, but DPR in the sixth round, if he's a if he's a good one, and I think his potential could lead him to being a really damn good one, that's going to be an absolute steal when we look back at it. All right, NFC West, Cardinals, Michael Wilson. Uh, him or Garrett Williams work for me here. I'm fine with either one. Wilson went second, so to me, felt like a little bit better value. Uh, we'll see if they, what they do with DeAndre Hopkins, but uh, whether it's an immediate D-hop replacement or long-term, I think he could be that possession X contested catch guy. Uh, and to get him you know, in the 90s, I thought was just an absolute steal. Has the injury problems, but if he's healthy, he, he will make that you know pick 92 or whatever it was look like an absolute steal. Uh, then the Rams, Trey Tomlinson, I mean, like I said yesterday, they drafted a start in the sixth round, whether it's in the nickel or on the outside where they've been able to make it work with small corners. This guy's going to be a starter for them. I, I have a hard time thinking he's not starting somewhere in that secondary for the Rams. So to get him in the sixth round it is an absolute steal. And furthermore, a guy who played great college football, this is not like a guy that you're projecting maybe it would be better at the NFL level. No, this guy was a great college corner. He's just small. And he also played on the outside. So again, maybe he plays outside for the Rams and this pick looks that much more valuable because of it. But they drafted a really good football player in the sixth round because he's five foot eight. And the Rams have been able to make that work with five foot eight Darius Williams and five foot nine, you know, uh, uh, Troy Hill. You know, I, I don't think they're worried about it. So I uh, love the value there that the Rams got with Trey Tomlinson. 49ers, again, this is, you know, a tough class because it's like, man... I don't really love a lot of what they did. But I decided to go Daryl Luter uh, Jr., small school guy in Southern Alabama, but great PFF grades in the film that I was able to find. Does look really good. Has solid size, six foot one, 190 pounds. So I don't know if he'll do it immediately, especially when you already have Tarveris Ward. I like Ambry Thomas coming out of Stanford. Um, maybe he's not an immediate starter, but I could see by year three maybe because, you know, Ward's gone or, you know, Thomas doesn't get any better. He could develop into a nice cover three uh, outside corner for them and someone that Steve Wilkes uh, starts to lean on by the back half of his rookie contract. So again, I'm not really in love with a whole lot of San Francisco's moves, but I could see where Ward Luter becomes a future starter. And therefore, day three pick, you love the draft future starters there. Uh, Olu Uluwatimi or Olu Shigan Uluwatimi if you want to hear the full name. Uh, Seahawks drafted a future starter in the fifth round. All right. Did I say future starter? I meant immediate starter in the fifth round. I'd be shocked if Uluwatimi is not the week one starter for this team. I think he's a good fit for that zone blocking scheme. Uh, I think he's got enough movement skills to kind of keep up and, and, and hold his own there. 
And center is the one spot for Seattle where it's like, yeah, that's the one That's the one area that offensive line needs an upgrade. They could get better at both guard spots, but they needed a center. And they got Uluwatimi in the fifth round. And just like Whipler, I think it's because he's a center only. Uh, I think that's why Uluwatimi and Whipler ultimately fell behind guys like John Gaines and um, uh, Juice Scruggs and Joe Tittman and all that. I mean, I think Tittman's better than those guys. But, you know, like Scruggs and... and, and um, um, John Gaines, I, I thought Ulua Timmy and Whipler should have gone before those guys, but I guess guard center flexibility ultimately won out. And because of that, Seahawks benefit and they draft an immediate starter in the fifth round. All right, last division to talk about. The Chicago Bears, this is very DB <laughs> heavy here until the very last team. Uh, but Terrell Smith, I mean, another guy who had his name get hot at the, kind of the wrong time. He was a little bit late of, a, of a, a name starting to garner traction, even later than Chandler Zavala, who I was like, okay, now he's peaking at the right time. He's going to become a second rounder. Obviously, goes a lot later. Terrell Smith, you know, day three pick, seventh rounder for the Bears, who, yeah, they draft Tyreek Stevenson in the second round, who's a good athlete, has the size, feels like a great fit for that cover two defense. But in the event he doesn't work out or Jalen Jones can't stay healthy, I have a hard time thinking Terrell Smith's not better than Kendall Vildor pretty much right away. Uh, and I mean, he's got the size, great athlete. And I think the combination of his height and his arm length, this guy makes a lot of sense for a cover two defense where he'll press the line and sit and chill in a soft squad zone. I think minimum he can do that. Uh, so again, in the event of a Jalen Johnson injury, Tyreek Stevenson not working out, I could see Terrell Smith being a starting outside corner for Chicago and had his name garnered more traction a month earlier, I don't think he makes it to the seventh round. On the Lions, Brian Branch, easy one. Nobody on day two had a bigger disparity of where they were drafted versus where they were on my big board. He was the top 10 player on my board, and they got him at 45. I don't know what else to say about that. He's a Chauncey Gardner Johnson replacement long term, but he's also an immediate starter there in the slot, at least how I, I think the depth chart's going to play out for Detroit. And he's a guy that can, they're going to be able to do so many different things with. He'll be great in the run game because he's such a sure tackler and give them some reinforcements that they need. He'll hover around the line of scrimmage, be an impact player, and read QB's eyes in zone. He'll be sticky man coverage. You can blitz with them. I mean, yeah. And especially going to an Aaron Glenn defense where Glenn was the DB's coach in New Orleans when they had Tronson Gardner Johnson, part of the reason he's there in Detroit for a one-year contract. He's going to literally get to work with the guy who kind of set the mold for that position and work with the former New Orleans Saints DBs coach who helped mold that position into existence in NOLA with C.J. Garner johnson And then now he's the D.C. The Aaron Glenn is the D.C. in uh, Detroit. So uh, love the landing spot there for a branch. And again, insane value. Uh, pa- uh, Packers, Anthony Johnson Jr. I think they drafted a Rasul Douglas replacement in the seventh round. And honestly, you know, he took some snaps at free safety. Uh, depending on what they want to do with Adrian Amos, who's still out there on the free agent market at the time of me recording this, Maybe he does that instead, you know, uh, outside corner moved inside to play a little bit of safety, play a little slot corner for uh, Iowa State. Again, I think he could be an immediate replacement for Rasul Douglas, save some money this year, depending on what they want to do with that money or next year where that cap hits close to $10 million. So I, I think he's at least your Rasul Douglas replacement. But I'd be curious. I wonder if they do want to see what he looks like at free safety, maybe during rookie OTAs. And maybe that's the determining factor of, hey, are we going to bring back Adrian Amos or are we going to give this job to Anthony Johnson Jr.? Either way, I'd be floored if Anthony Johnson Jr. is not a starter within the next two years. Um, and because of that, you draft in the seventh round. Uh, again, I, how could you not love that? And the last player we're going to talk about here, the Vikings. All well, the same stuff I said yesterday and kind of with the same stuff I talked about with Anthony Johnson Jr. there. The Vikings drafted a future starter here in the seventh round. And I mean, I mean it. I love Dwayne McBride maybe more than most, but um, one of the most productive runners in college football, one of the highest graded runners using PFF's data in college football. May not be the guy that's going to take it to the house from 80 yards out, but easily can be kind of Blake Corum-ish, pick up 10 to 20 yard chunks at a time. Good explosiveness, good vision, good contact balance, can win with power, a little shifty, maybe not, you know, insanely, you know, got a Devon A chain or anything like that, but uh, don't let his elusiveness go by the wayside. He's got some, he's got some shiftiness in him. And, you know, Dalvin Cook lost a step last year. Does that continue this year? If so, there's already a starting job up for grabs, in my opinion. Alexander Madison towards the end of his time in Minnesota, in my opinion. Um, And long term, I could see Dwayne McBride, Ty Chandler being that one-two punch. I could see Chandler replacing Madison and Cook. And I could see Dwayne McBride stepping in and being the early downs guy. I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of receiving value. But that's why I think Ty Chandler, awesome receiver, kind of your prototypical elusiveness, uh, scat back type paired up with Dwayne McBride. That's your your lightning with uh, Chandler and your your thunder with McBride. If you want to kind of continue in that mold, because we talked about Deuce Vaughn earlier, maybe the new image of running back backfield should just be who can catch the football. I want more pass catchers. I want more weapons. I'm not mad about that either. But 
I think McBride, especially if there's an injury this year, I wouldn't be surprised if he's the lead back by week 18. Honestly, like if Cook gets hurt, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if McBride starts outpacing Madison. I, I really wouldn't. But that is going to do it for my favorite value pick for all 32 teams. I gave you one player from all 32 draft classes and which one I thought was the most valuable selection for each team. Now let me hear your thoughts down below in the comments section. Who was the best value pick for each team? Or at least let me tell you, or let me hear who your favorite value pick was for your favorite squad. Also, be sure to tell me who your favorite team is. That will certainly help me out a ton. But let me hear your thoughts down below in the comment section. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Be sure to hit that like button if you did and subscribe if you're new to the channel and want to see more football content. But that is going to do it for me. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach and I am